So this is a gentleman who came in as a STEMI, so an acute MI to another facility. Uh, they ballooned open his LAD, which was the infarct-related artery, and he was transferred because there was concern that he would need open heart surgery. Unfortunately, uh, his ejection fraction, his heart function was quite depressed after all of this. We did an MRI that showed that that part of his heart, where the heart attack was, had died during the heart attack and was now uh, unlikely to recover. So instead of going to bypass surgery for his LAD and diagonals, and also to an obtuse marginal, I'll show you the angiogram, the decision was made to uh, stent the obtuse marginal. So the complete trial uh, from late last year told us that within four weeks for patients who have an acute MI, uh, anything that is angiographically severe or physiologically significant should be fixed in order to improve mortality. Uh, so this was a patient in whom we treated for the complete trial, uh, left the infarct-related artery, the LAD alone, because it wasn't alive, and then treated that obtuse marginal, which was ugly and ulcerated, uh, and subtotally occluded. So as usual, put a couple of workhorse wires down. I thought that the angiographic stenosis was greater than 70%. So I didn't perform physiology in this setting. It wouldn't have changed my management uh, in this kind of a patient where I think that um, even if it's greater than 70%, but the IFR were to be normal, I would likely still treat, especially knowing that this part of the heart is viable. So eagle eye is down distal of the vessel. I have a workhorse wire in the AP groove to protect it just in case, because I thought that the plaque would come back all the way to the ostium. So here on sync, as we pull back, there's not a great landing zone distal. Um, so, which is common. And as I said, only about half of patients in the clinical trial who had IBIS guided PCI were able to meet all of the criteria. I think we did at this point. So starting distally and scrolling through, that's relatively decent. It's going to end up being less than 50% plaque burden, but only just. And then as we move forward, there's some spicules of calcium at 12 o'clock there, some softer plaque, and now a relatively dense segment of calcium uh, from 9 to 12, and then about 180 degrees on this side. So this is a case where I would definitely take a high-pressure balloon and make sure that it expands 100% prior to putting in a stent. The last thing I want to do is put in a stent, have a dog bone, and then not have much to do with it other than high pressure ballooning, laser, uh, whatever I have to do to get a good result. Approximately, I thought there was a good cuff of a landing zone. You can see the workhorse wire in the body of the circumflex coming back there. So I thought that I had a spot where I could land and do so relatively successfully. So proximally, proximally uh, my reference, so this is an area with 23% plaque burden. And again, for stent sizing proximally, which I use for post dilation, not for picking the stent, uh, it was a 3.8 millimeter lumen to lumen, or excuse me, media to media reference. So take a quarter millimeter off of that, 3.55 would be my target for post dilution proximally. And then distally, it's a bit bigger than I would have expected on the angiogram. Found a spot with 24% plaque burden right at the very beginning of the, the run. This was a 3.15 vessel, so 2.9 would be the reference. So in this instance, I put in a 2.7 by 23 millimeter drug eluting stent with plans to post dilate it proximally so that it matched. So 22.2, so I gave myself 0.8 millimeters uh, error on either side just to challenge myself. Again, the less metal in the body, likely the better. So put in the stent, post dilated, repeat the intravascular ultrasound. Don't pay any attention to the tip of the wire, which looks like it's horribly mangled. Um, and then here is my pullback run. So the distal stent edge is in a decent spot. I'm still getting hung up a little bit on the calcium there. And then pulls back through. So let's see if I can go back and manipulate that video just a bit. So distally, here's what I'm looking at is where's my distal stent edge? And how much of the lumen does it fill up? Am I going to be leaving more than 50% residual plaque? And I thought I was relatively good. And I'll show you the measurements on that. And then as I'm pulling back, I want to make sure that my stent is well expanded. Ideally circular, but sometimes you can't achieve that because of extrinsic calcification. So you'll see distally that spot where there was 180 degrees of calcium did provide a little bit of compression, but went through and found the smallest area on the stent, ensured that there was no dissection proximally or distally. I didn't end up coming back into the main body of the circumflex. Again, a couple of examples of uh, trying to avoid stenting into the main vessel so as to improve outcomes. Bifurcation outcomes are a little bit uh, worse than single stenting. Try to avoid it when we can. 
So my MSA at this point was 6.1 square millimeters. So definitely greater than five. And as you can recall from before, it's still bigger than the distal reference lumen before we began the procedure. So then on angiogram, luminogram, again, it looks good, um, but that's really not what I'm here for at this point. I'm taking the angiogram to look for any complications, any perforations that I'm not gonna be able to see on IBIS guidance. We do do zero contrast PCI, uh, and that's a risk that I counsel patients on that if I can't take this final shot, I may miss a perforation that might be clinically meaningful. 